Welcome to Electron Online and in our search about the origin of the solar system and the universe in general, let's go and take another look at the abundance of the elements. There's actually something extremely unique about them. Okay, everybody pretty well is familiar with the periodic table, at least most people have seen one. And of course the periodic table is structured in such a way that it explains the number of protons, the number of electrons, the orbitals and so forth. But when you start looking at the relative abundance of the elements in the solar system, and in the universe in general, you begin to come up with a very strange observation. So, where do all elements in the universe come from? Well, to begin with, hydrogen came from the very beginning of the universe during the Big Bang, and the helium shortly afterwards through, during the, what we call the nucleosynthesis, when the universe was so hot that it fused a quarter of all of its hydrogen into helium, and that happened in a very short period of time, estimated to be about 20 minutes. After that, we recognized that lithium and beryllium were some trace elements that were, that were also cooked up during this nucleosynthesis period. And then all else, besides these elements, were produced inside stars. So just about every element besides the basic ones on the periodic table were cooked up inside stars. Some of them during the normal fusion from, hydrogen, from helium into carbon, but the vast majority of elements came from supernova explosions where the core of the star simply exploded and the massive amount of energy just created the fusion of all the other elements on the periodic table. Now, when we take a look at these elements and we chart them in terms of abundance versus the atomic number, and keeping in mind that this is a logarithmic scale, so for example, that every mark here is is 10 times less than the mark before, we can see that there's about 10 times as much hydrogen as there is helium, and then the elements after that are in existence in a much lower abundance. For example, oxygen, is there's only about 1 100 times as much oxygen as is helium, and so forth. Notice how there's a zigzag between certain elements. And what that means is that these elements are more abundant than these ones, and that's more abundant than this one, and so forth. And these are all about there in about the same abundance, and these are all there in about the same abundance, slowly decreasing with heavier and heavier elements. But what's unique about this concept here is that the difference in abundance between these jumps right here is about 10 to 1. In other words, there's about 10 times as much neon as there is sodium, and 10 times as much magnesium compared to aluminum, and about 10 times as much silicon as compared to phosphorus. Those are, of course, not exact comparisons, but there's a huge difference between the abundance of these elements and the abundance of these elements. And that also holds true to some different ratio here. If you look carefully, the, uh, the atomic number of the elements on top are even numbers, and the ones on the bottom are odd numbers. In other words, the universe produced about 10 times as many of the even elements as compared to the odd elements on a periodic table. That is absolutely astounding. So in a relative abundance, there's about a 10 to 1 ratio between those elements. And you can see in some cases it's even much more than that. There's way more oxygen than fluorine and much more so than a 10 to 1 ratio. This looks more like a 1,000 or maybe 10,000 to 1 ratio. But notice carbon, which is atomic number 6, oxygen, atomic number 8, neon, 10, magnesium 12, silicon 14, sulfur 16, argon 18, calcium 20, and so forth, and iron being 26, one of the more abundant elements in the universe. Absolutely astounding. There's something about the way a fusion process works that is more likely to produce these elements as the, these elements, and that's why there's way more of them than of these. Absolutely astounding. Just really, really amazing to have that kind of differentiation between the production of elements on the periodic table, all because the way nuclear fusion works inside stars, and when a supernova explosion occurs, when these heavy elements are produced, again, in that same zigzag ratio, even ones are much more likely to be produced than odd ones. And, of course, there's an answer to that. There's an answer to everything. We may not know what the answer is, but in this case, we have a pretty good idea. Most of the fusion processes occur inside stars when Helium particles are slammed into the existing nuclei, making heavier particles. And of course, helium nuclei have two protons and two neutrons. And it's those two protons that then cause the next element to be produced. So you have calcium, and you slam a helium nucleus into calcium, you will produce an oxygen. You will not produce a nitrogen or a fluorine. Now, that doesn't mean that those can also not be produced. 
nuclear fusion can occur when a hydrogen nucleus, simply a proton, is slammed into an existing nucleus, therefore forming an element of the next category, one higher in, in uh, what we call atomic number than the one before. But as you can see, that process is much less likely to happen in nuclear fusion than the process when helium nuclei are slammed into existing um, nuclei to make the next heavy element. And it's usually done in steps of two protons rather than steps of one proton. Quite an amazing discovery, and it's just another way of looking at the universe and our solar system and understanding why our solar system looks the way it does and why the elements that exist in the solar system are in those relative abundances based upon something that happened in stars a long time ago. And that's how we figured it out.